I wonder if it's not a thief. I frowned at the men's and women's shoes visible at the entrance. Our house should be empty, with neither my husband nor I present. Yet, there's a presence of someone, both at the entrance and in the bathroom. The vulgar voice coming from the bathroom made it clear someone was having a good time. It's common for husbands to call their mistresses over when their wives are out, but that's impossible. This voice, could it be? My husband, standing next to me, is staring at the bathroom with a pale face. My name is Taylor. I've been married to Kevin for two years. Being a dual-income couple, we don't have children yet. However, I believe we lead a peaceful and affectionate life, going out or traveling on our days off. Fortunately, neither our parents nor our in-laws rush us about having children. In fact, our parents and in-laws live nearby, allowing us to have a good relationship where we can gather for family dinners. The slightly old but magnificent house we rented was introduced to us by our in-laws. The dinner parties, which happen once a month, if at all, are mostly held at our place. The standard is for mom and me to cook, enjoying the evening with dad's favorite wine and the food brought by our in-laws. That day, mom had come over from the morning to prepare for the dinner party, but the usually cheerful mom seemed somewhat gloomy, cutting the ingredients and expressing concern. Do we really need this much? We might not be able to finish it all. She started saying things she wouldn't usually say. Mom, what's wrong? We've only prepared the usual amount for today. When I dared to ask, Mom looked at me surprised and then laughed it off. I'm sorry, dear. It's just that Dad has been eating less lately and I'm worried. Really? Is Dad not feeling well? Dad has been an independent businessman since his youth, the so-called entrepreneur. Dad has always been focused on work since I was a child, and I hardly have any memories of him playing with me on his days off. Even so, as his daughter, it worries me to think that he might have worked himself sick. Mom seemed hesitant to say it, but perhaps thinking it cruel to worry me unnecessarily, she finally opened up. It's not an illness. Dad is perfectly healthy. But lately, he's been cold, finding fault with dinner or commenting on how plain my clothes are. What's that about? That's terrible, saying such things to mom, who's always been the backbone of our home. I'm fine. Maybe dad is just a bit tired from starting a new business. Mom insisted she was okay. The conversation drifted off, and though concerned, I went back to cooking. Today, we plan to lay out a lavish spread, including dad's favorite steak and pie, as a gesture of support for his new business venture. As for what Kevin was doing, he's the type who can't rest until every nook and cranny is clean, given his fondness for cleanliness. Even if it's just family, he meticulously cleans the entrance and living room whenever we have guests. As I began to tidy up the planters in the garden, dad, my mother-in-law Sarah, and my father-in-law, Sean, gathered around. Taylor, can I have a moment? Yes, Sarah? This happened as I was checking the temperature of the pan to cook the steak. Sarah, who appeared in the kitchen, had a grim expression for some reason. She silently handed me a box that seemed to be a gift, and puzzled, I accepted it. To my surprise, it bore the logo of a restaurant famous for its steaks. Indicating she had gone out of her way to bring it, Upon opening the lid, I found it contained thick, high-quality steaks, their savory aroma wetting the appetite. It seemed we had inadvertently prepared the same dish. However, I thought it would be easy enough to just cook fewer steaks. After all, it wasn't the first time our gifts had coincidentally matched. Wow, did you go out of your way to buy this? We heard it was a celebration, but you could have told us about the steaks. This is awkward. Can we just serve the gift steaks today? But you have Kevin, and you two can eat it, right? We're not young anymore, and too much meat can be hard on our stomachs. I found myself at a loss for words. Everyone is nearing 60. It felt wrong to prepare so much food and have it go to waste, especially after mom helped with the preparations. You should have said something. How thoughtless. I was taken aback by Sarah's comment as she left. However, she didn't notice my reaction and exited the kitchen with the steaks. It was my first time being on the receiving end of such a remark. We had never coordinated on gifts before. 
Even when things ended up being the same, it turned into a source of laughter for us. Moreover, all previous gifts had been sweets or similar items. I felt a bit uneasy, but assumed perhaps the higher-end gift had touched a nerve, so I didn't dwell on it too much. At the dinner party, Dad was thrilled with the steak from the high-end restaurant. Mom seemed to understand my gesture with just a glance and, without mentioning the steak we had prepared, pretended to be just as delighted. After Sarah, Sean, and Dad had left, Mom skillfully turned the leftover ingredients into beef stew, thankfully before they were cooked. We could have still had the steak. You both would have gotten tired of steak. This way, you can take it home. Mom took her share in a food storage container. Although I felt bad, the beef stew mom made was delicious, and Kevin and I quickly finished it off as the flavors melded together. I later heard that despite its deliciousness, Dad complained while eating it, calling it outdated. I was furious, but ended up just holding on to those feelings, unable to resolve them, especially with mom just giving a wry smile. A few weeks after such a dinner party, I received a sudden message from Kevin, who was supposed to be away on an overnight business trip. It turned out that the business trip was canceled due to the client's circumstances. He said he would be coming home as usual today. Since he was scheduled to be away for three days, I had planned to spend some time at my parents' home. However, with him coming home, plans changed, so I had to inform my mom about the change in plans. While finishing up my usual shopping, I met up with Kevin and we headed home together. Huh? Did we forget to turn off the lights? I thought I had. When we arrived home, there was a light leaking from the entrance, even though I was sure we had turned everything off before leaving. Concerned about the wasted electricity, I apologized, but Kevin reassured me, don't worry about it. He chuckled as he inserted the key into the front door, then fell silent. What's wrong? The front door is unlocked. Kevin's words made me catch my breath, thinking it might be a burglar. I quietly activated my mobile phone and started recording. After I nodded to signal him, Kevin slowly opened the front door. Whose shoes are these? In the entryway, there were a pair of men's leather shoes and women's pumps. Kevin's remark made it clear these shoes belonged to someone we didn't know. If these had been Kevin's and he wasn't here right now, I might think he was cheating by bringing another woman home, but he's right here, next to me. Someone unknown to us was in our house. Sensing my reaction, Kevin grabbed his umbrella, ready to swing it at any moment, and moved forward. Then, we saw the living room light was on, and the food that seemed to have been bought scattered on the table. Strange for a burglar, I thought. Then I heard a voice, approaching slowly. It became clear the voice was coming from the bathroom. It seems that the person speaking is inside the bathroom. This voice. I can understand why Kevin is truly creeped out. After all, the voice coming from inside is quite vulgar. It's unsettling and infuriating to think that our home could be used without our knowledge. Wondering who on earth could be doing this, I slowly open the door and my eyes immediately fell on some discarded clothing. Ugh. I couldn't help but let out a sound. There, unmistakably, were Dad's clothes. The large jacket, neatly hung on a hanger, was his favorite he had worn at the dinner party just the other day. The messily discarded shirt and pants were all too familiar. Mom had just left a few hours ago, so there was no way she could be here. It appeared that Dad was bringing another woman into my home for an affair. The realization made me frown involuntarily. Looking up at Kevin, wondering how to explain this to him, I saw him staring with a ghastly pale face at a necklace resting atop the washing machine. I remembered seeing that necklace and the earrings beside it quite recently. This can't be... Mom? Kevin's words confirmed the identity of the person inside the bathroom. The ones using our home for their affair were my dad and Sarah. I pulled Kevin, who seemed ready to burst in on them, back to the living room quietly. Moving away from the echoing voices seemed to help him regain some composure. Shouldn't we call your mom and my dad? 
Kevin suggested, though he seemed confused. What would happen if we brought Mom and Sean here now? I could only foresee a crisis for both families, but I couldn't just ignore what was happening. Vulgar noises were still coming from the bathroom, indicating they might not come out anytime soon. I contacted Mom, and Kevin reached out to Sean right then. It's about Dad. Your dad? He said he was going golfing today and left early in the morning. He won't be back until the night. Should I tell him to call you when he gets back? It seems that Dad is at home with Sarah. I couldn't bring myself to mention what was happening in the bathroom, but that was enough for Mom to understand the gravity of the situation. In a frightening tone, she said, I'll be right there, and hung up. Less than 10 minutes later, Mom arrived with a pale face and Sean looking utterly bewildered. The voices had stopped, but they were still inside the bathroom. The sound of the shower was audible, but thankfully, the voices that had filled the hallway earlier were no longer heard. Kevin? What do you mean Sarah is here? Like I said earlier, Mom went on a day trip with friends and won't be back until tonight. Sean asked, full of questions. We had informed him that Dad was with someone, but whether he was confused or unwilling to accept it, he desperately avoided looking towards the bathroom. Feeling sorry for Sean, Kevin signaled to me, and I started recording on my mobile phone again. Kevin made no effort to conceal his approach as he charged into the bathroom. Hey, what the heck are you doing in our house? The bathroom door, hit hard by Kevin, made a dull sound. Screams from Dad and Sarah were followed by the escalating shouts between Dad and Kevin. Kevin, having forced the door open, grumbled with a tone filled with disgust. I grabbed the bath towel and tossed it into the bathroom, wanting to avoid seeing their nudity at all costs. I don't want to see them naked. Behind me, Mom, apparently unable to hold back any longer, pushed past me and stormed into the bathroom. She shoved Kevin and Sarah aside, and with a roar unlike anything I had heard from her before, she forcibly dragged Dad out of the bathroom. Sean, having finally steeled himself, followed Mom into the bathroom and pulled Sarah out. Then, both of them hastily dressed in their hastily discarded clothes, sitting in the hallway with their hair still damp. In just a matter of minutes, all of us, myself included, were panting heavily, our shoulders rising and falling with each breath. Mom's thin voice broke the silence. Why? Her question marked the beginning of Dad and Sarah's explanations. It all began with Sarah's crush on Dad. Given that Dad is a company president, he has connections with some flashy industries. He pays much more attention to his appearance than men his age, and even from my perspective, He's stylish and sophisticated. Sarah reportedly fell for Dad from the moment they met, captivated by his demeanor. Their relationship started to develop during the family meetings organized for mine and Kevin's wedding. Sarah, trying to portray herself as a good woman, eagerly took charge of organizing the dinner parties, gradually becoming closer to Dad. At one of these dinner parties, she finally gathered the courage to confess her feelings. At this point, Kevin, looking nauseous, glared at Sarah, but the problem also involved Dad. He was drawn to Sarah, who adorned herself with bold makeup and flashy clothes, exuding a feminine allure over Mom, who diligently looked after the home. However, both Dad and Sarah had their own families. Mom often worked at the same company as Dad, and on Dad's days off, Sean usually had a similar schedule. Therefore, they needed a place to meet discreetly. Surprisingly, they chose our home. Kevin and I, having a hobby of taking short trips and staying at hotels, even if they were nearby during long weekends, inadvertently provided them with the opportunity. At that point, Sarah said, It's not safe to leave the house empty for too long, so I'll check on it. She would say this to confirm our absence and then contact Dad. Since we were neighbors and shared our plans without any suspicion, our house was unknowingly made available for their use. We never gave them a spare key, 
thinking it impossible for them to enter. But it seems they secretly took the key during one of the dinner parties and made a copy. Moreover, they were careful to leave no trace of their presence in our house. They brought their own food, took all the trash with them, collected any hairs from the drain after using the bathroom, and wiped down any moisture before leaving. This time, Dad contacted Sarah after finding out that I was going back to my parents' house because of Kevin's business trip. I had only informed Mom about the change in plans, leading to this unexpected encounter. If it hadn't been discovered now, it's hard to tell how long we would have been deceived. Naturally, both were served with divorce papers by their respective partners, faced claims for compensation in the divorce proceedings, and were disowned by Kevin and me. Although Dad and Sarah admitted to their actions initially, they started claiming we were lying and had no evidence later. However, I had recorded everything on my mobile phone, and presenting that as evidence, the divorce proceedings went smoothly with lawyers involved. We used the settlement money to move into an apartment. Kevin, who was a bit of a germaphobe, has developed a complete aversion to the bathroom from that day, refusing to even go near it. I too found it painful to continue living in a house that had been used for their affair, so I was fully in agreement with moving. Now, Mom, having lost all affection for Dad, lives with the two of us. After the divorce was finalized, Sarah seemed quite pleased. She became brazenly defiant, perhaps due to Dad's influence, and accepted the divorce settlement and compensation without much resistance. She moved in with Dad right after the divorce, and they got married, fulfilling their desire to be together. It seemed like a perfect outcome for them, with Sarah becoming the wife of a company president, looking forward to a great life ahead. However, their plans went awry. Dad's new business venture failed, and the company's performance rapidly deteriorated, like a balloon being deflated. Mom, upon hearing this, simply nodded as if to say it was to be expected. Who do you think was covering for dad all this time? Indeed, it was mom who had been diligently managing the complaints about dad's forceful business tactics, both inside and outside the company, quietly supporting the business. She handled a major part of the company's accounting and dealt with clients. Naturally, she resigned from the company at the same time as the divorce. And dad, Far from opposing this, was eager to get rid of her, leading to an inadequate handover. As a result, the company was left with employees dissatisfied with dad, and many followed mom's lead and resigned, leading to a shortage of staff. Dad had always thought that supporting him was a wife's duty, so he naturally expected Sarah to take over. However, Sarah, who had always been a housewife, had no understanding of the business, and proved to be of no help at all. The exodus of employees, fueled by the president's divorce scandal, became widespread gossip, leading clients to withdraw from dad's company one after another, citing poor performance. Dad's company couldn't survive even half a year and soon went bankrupt. Their house and assets were seized and burdened with significant debt, including unpaid wages. The two managed to find refuge in a cheap apartment living a meager existence. Dad, despite his age and wishing for a company that would treat him as a president, couldn't secure a new job. Naturally, his unemployment persisted, and he resorted to gambling as a means of stress relief. Not satisfied with just that, None of this would have happened if it weren't for the affair. It was Sarah who seduced me. In his rage, he began to resort to violence towards Sarah. Sarah, trying to make ends meet with part-time jobs and desperately supporting dad, grew disillusioned with him as he sank deeper into gambling addiction and squandered even their living expenses. Unable to bear dad's repeated verbal abuse, one day she fled the apartment. She ended up at Sean's house. It was the house where Kevin had grown up. Kevin and I happened to be visiting Sean, who had become somewhat reclusive due to the emotional toll of the divorce and we often checked in on him. Without ringing the doorbell and finding the front door open, we went to see who it was and were met by Sarah. Initially, we didn't recognize her, 
She looked so different that we thought a stranger, an old woman, was speaking to us. The once beautifully made up Sarah was nowhere to be seen. Exhausted, Sarah attempted to apologize and seek forgiveness for her past actions, but I could only respond with a bitter expression, thinking it was too convenient. Sean must have been quite shocked, yet it seemed he was somewhat swayed by the return of the woman he once loved. While he was pondering how to ask her to leave, Kevin, who was standing next to him, suddenly clutched his mouth and crouched down on the ground. Remembering Sarah's affair in the bathroom, he couldn't hold back and vomited right there. In a panic, Sean and I rushed to bring a trash can and water and ended up hearing Kevin's cries of rejection towards Sarah from behind his back. Feeling sorry for Kevin and wondering how to resolve the situation, it was Sean who stood up to take action. Sean looked Sarah squarely in the eyes and unequivocally denied any possibility of reconciliation. Leave! With firm words, he sent Sarah away. Sarah seemed deeply affected by her own son's vehement rejection, enough to make him physically ill. Without a word, she staggered at the front door and left. Since that incident, Sarah has apparently kept her distance from Sean. There has been no contact from Dad or Sarah since then, so it's safe to assume that our ties with them have been completely severed. Kevin was under the weather for a few days, but has since recovered. Together, we're committed to building a warm and loving home. Mom has shown incredible resilience, quickly finding work, making new friends, and moving on from Dad to enjoy her life. She's planning to rent an apartment for herself once she's saved enough, and I'm hoping she'll choose one close to our home. As for Sean, he seems to have perked up a bit after adopting a stray cat that wandered into his yard. Taking in one cat has apparently led to more cats gathering at his place, and now it's known in the neighborhood as a popular hangout for cats. The ordeal caused by Dad and Sarah involved the whole family in a tumultuous situation. However, those of us who remain have strengthened our bonds and are doing our best to move forward. My name is Alyssa, a 36-year-old housewife juggling part-time work and raising two children. While I'm generally content with my day-to-day -day life, my husband Jackson, a corporate employee of the same age, often prioritizes his mother Shannon over our family. Plans for family outings are frequently altered to accommodate Shannon's requests, such as weeding her garden or accompanying her on shopping trips, even if it means canceling visits to my parents' home. Jackson has even gone as far as changing our child's birthday cake from their chosen character theme to a fruit tart recommended by Shannon. Under the guise of it being healthier, Mom says kids need to eat lots of fruit and get their nutrients. His disregard for our children's disappointment leads to frequent confrontations between us. Shannon, for her part, seems to relish Jackson's prioritization of her, deriving a sense of superiority from it. Even if it comes at the expense of her grandchildren, Sorry about that, kids. It's grandma's fault. Yet, her apologies are delivered with a smile. Moreover, Shannon's condescending attitude towards me, coupled with external praise of her as a wonderful mother-in-law, strains our relationship further. Since the passing of my father-in-law, Jackson has indulged Shannon even more, exacerbating her behavior. With our 10th wedding anniversary approaching, I suggested we do something special. Hey, since it's our 10th anniversary this year, how about we go out for a meal at a restaurant? We could ask Shannon or my parents to watch the kids. Has it been 10 years already? Sounds good. Let's book a nice place. What was that restaurant that was featured on TV? We decided to book a reservation at an upscale restaurant we wouldn't normally visit. Jackson was enthusiastic and quickly called Shannon to ask her to watch the kids. Even though it was still nearly two months away, I was looking forward to a special anniversary celebration. On the anniversary day, I was entertaining the kids while eagerly anticipating the evening. Jackson, who said he would come straight home after work, hadn't returned. Perhaps he suddenly had to work overtime, but I spoke to him this morning and he shouldn't have forgotten that it was today. These thoughts have been circling in my mind for a while now. After all, there's been no reply from Jackson, despite my attempts to contact him, 
leaving me completely in the dark about the situation on his end. Moreover, I can't get in touch with Shannon, who was supposed to look after the children, making it difficult to wait for Jackson at the restaurant as planned. As a last resort, I called Jackson's office. Upon requesting to speak with Jackson, I was informed that he had finished work and already left. I thanked them politely and hung up. Wondering why he hadn't responded to my messages if he was already done with work, all I could do now was wait. My daughters, who were aware of tonight's plans, started glancing at the clock, expressing concern about how late it was getting. Indeed. I replied tersely, unable to take my eyes off the ticking clock hands. Even if he had left for work just before I called, he should have been home by now, since he drove to work this morning. I continued waiting for Jackson until just before the reservation time, but I couldn't wait any longer. The reservation was for 7pm, and it was nearly time. I decided to call the restaurant to inform them of our delay. Hello? Your party has already been seated? Alone? No, as per your reservation. There are two guests. Can you tell me who came? A man who appears to be a company employee and an older woman. Excuse me, but may I ask who's calling? Upon hearing that, I quickly ended the call, saying, It's a misunderstanding on my part, I'm sorry, and hung up in a rush. An older woman. Could it be? I immediately called Jackson. After several rings, he finally picked up, sounding very annoyed. Yeah? What is it? You've been nagging me. Where are you? You're not already at the restaurant, are you? I am. We're already seated. Mom insisted on dining here, so I decided to have dinner with her tonight. We can celebrate our anniversary at a local restaurant this weekend. You like the pizza there, right? It was indeed Shannon. The audacity of Shannon to join an anniversary dinner, knowing full well what it was, and Jackson's actions in not only allowing this, but also taking my place without any communication, filled me with disgust, not just anger. Especially knowing that I had been looking forward to this for two months, and his idea of making it up to me was a meal at a local restaurant. It was a clear indication of the absolute preference Jackson had for Shannon over me. The kids will be disappointed they can't have grandma's cooking, so make them something they like tonight. I'm counting on you. Wait a second. I tried to stop Jackson as he was about to hang up. Our parents gave us gifts for our 10th anniversary, you know. They said they wanted to hear all about our dinner. Gifts? Your parents always give me stuff I don't like. Just throw away anything that's not cash. Jackson's suggestion to discard gifts filled with everyone's well wishes was appalling. I gave him one last chance, almost as a gesture of mercy. All right, but you might regret this later. You sure it's okay to throw them away? Jackson seemed puzzled by my insinuation, but his stance appeared unchanged. Regret what? I just need the cash. Oh, the food's here, so I'm hanging up. Don't call me again, all right? Bye. I sighed as I hung up the phone, noticing the worried looks from my children. It's gotten a bit late, but who wants to help me with dinner? Their eager hands lifted my spirits slightly. After dinner, I did as Jackson had said, sorting through the anniversary gifts. I kept the cash and prepared to discard the rest, feeling ashamed and sorry for those who had given them to us. It's astonishing that I've managed to stay with Jackson for 10 years. After finishing up and putting the kids to bed, Jackson came home. Don't you think it's terrible to prioritize Shannon, even on our special 10th anniversary day? It was my invitation, and you knew I was looking forward to it. You could have had dinner with Shannon any other day. Yeah, yeah. Don't sulk. I said I'd take you to the local restaurant next time, right? I'll even pay for half of it. It's not just about that. You said we didn't need the gifts everyone prepared for us because it's our anniversary. You're being persistent. I have work tomorrow. Can you just let me sleep? Jackson completely ignored the issue and went straight to bed after his shower. The next morning, thinking it was my last chance, I tried to talk to Jackson about yesterday's events. Hey, about the celebration gifts. Jackson, visibly annoyed, ignored me and left the living room, then went off to work without saying anything. Still angry from yesterday, I decided there was nothing more I could do after seeing his attitude. After seeing the children off to school, I received several calls from Jackson within just three hours. Thinking he was calling earlier than expected, 
I answered the phone to hear Jackson start speaking in a rushed manner. Hey, those celebration gifts you mentioned yesterday, who gave them to us? What do you mean? From my parents? Friends? And your boss, Mr. Jones. Even the company president gave us something. What? You never mentioned that. I did. I said they were gifts from our parents. You should have made that clearer. Mr. Jones and the company president have been close to my dad for years, and our families have been acquainted since I was a child. They've always treated me like family, and yesterday evening, they even made a special trip to our house to deliver their gifts. The watch the president picked out was really nice, and the wine Mr. Jones brought looked delicious. But it doesn't matter now, does it? You said to throw away anything that wasn't cash, so I did. What have you done, Alyssa? Do you realize what you've caused? Jackson was furious, but I wondered on what grounds he had to complain. I asked you if you were sure, and I tried to talk to you about it last night and again this morning, but you ignored me every time, Jackson. Don't shift the blame. It's your fault for not listening. With that, I hung up the phone. Jackson tried calling back several times, but I ignored all his calls. I might seem petty, but I couldn't contain my anger any longer. When Jackson came home, his footsteps were so loud I could hear him from the entrance. Enough already! Give me the gifts we received, now! Faced with Jackson demanding the return of the celebration gift, I threw them out with this morning's trash, so they've already been collected. There's no way to get them back now. I asked him. Jackson's anger reached a level I had never seen before. He shoved me and stomped on the floor. That's just unbelievable! Can't you differentiate between right and wrong, Alyssa? What's truly unbelievable is knowing it's our anniversary dinner and still going to the restaurant with Shannon, and telling me to throw away gifts without even looking at them is just insensitive. I lashed back at Jackson as he continued to shout. Amidst the heated argument, Jackson kept insisting that I was the one at fault. Just say you threw it away and apologize to them. I've already told everyone at work that, so there's nothing we can do now. Enraged by Jackson's selfish reasoning, I lost my temper. Oh, is that so? Then I'd like them to come here so I can apologize directly. What? What do you mean by that? It was clear he wasn't expecting my response. As the door to the next room opened, Jackson's face showed sheer panic. Mr. Jones and the president, appearing from the other room, left him dumbfounded. After hearing from Jackson, they found my behavior out of character and called me to hear my side of the story. I explained everything, starting with the fact that I had called his office while waiting for Jackson to come home. After hearing my explanation, concerned that a misunderstanding had arisen between us due to their celebratory gift, Jackson and I agreed to discuss the matter further and I decided to invite him over to our home. I decided it would be best to let him calm down before we talked, so I asked him to wait in the next room. Um, Mr. President, I'm terribly sorry about this. Realizing the situation, Jackson turned pale and apologized to them. Hearing from me about how he had acted the day before and his current attempts to shift the responsibility for the aftermath onto me. He must have realized there was no way to deny or evade the truth. His anger from moments ago gone. He now trembles slightly as he continues to apologize. Jackson? The president's voice was unexpectedly gentle, giving Jackson a glimmer of hope. This is a family matter and not related to the company, so I won't comment as your boss. That's right, we promise it won't affect your job evaluation. But remember, we're Alyssa's friends first and foremost. We'll have to excuse ourselves from any personal interactions with you moving forward. Jackson, who had boasted about his personal ties with them at work, was in disbelief. You can't be serious. Alyssa, say something. Isn't it embarrassing to involve others in a marital dispute? This isn't just a marital dispute. You mishandled the gifts from everyone, losing their personal respect. And frankly, I no longer need a husband who always puts his mother first and blames his wife for his own mistakes. I want a divorce. I felt sorry for involving the two of them in such a scene, but I declared my intentions boldly and left the house. It was the right decision to leave the children with their grandparents, considering it's not good for them to witness arguments. 
After our divorce, as the news spread throughout the company, Jackson faced various rumors due to the distant behavior of Mr. Jones and the president, whom he had previously been on good terms with. Jackson, who had once boasted about being favored by Mr. Jones and looked down on his colleagues and subordinates, now seems belittled as they mock him for being unable to even make small talk with Mr. Jones without his wife. Although there was some resistance leading up to the divorce, after the separation, he paid child support and met with the children once a month. However, every time they met, the conversation turned to how child support payments were burdensome and how the cost of dry cleaning was too high, always about money. Moreover, by trying to emotionally manipulate the children with tears and suggesting they all live together again, the kids, who were entering their teenage years, gradually began to resist meeting him. Currently, in respect of the children's wishes not to meet, the visits have been temporarily halted. Dad always cared more about Grandma than us. We don't have to live together. Recalling Jackson's reaction to her words still makes me laugh. After making that divorce declaration, I apologized to the president and Mr. Jones, Jackson's boss, and returned the celebratory gift I had kept hidden from Jackson. They accepted the return and from Mr. Jones. A divorce celebration gift! And with a laugh, he presented me once again with a bottle of my favorite liquor as a gift. Though I regret causing them concern, I believe our relationship, including with my parents, will continue in the future. After the divorce from Jackson was finalized and things settled down, the children and I were invited to a home party at the president's house. There, I was offered a job at the company run by the president's brother. I have been ignoring all the bothersome messages from Jackson. In my new workplace, which is understanding of parenting, I am supported by many people, and we, as a family, are living happily every day.